Guys, Danae, how about Whoa. that scene right there? Right here? I don't even know what to say after that. <laughs> okay, okay. Men Who Dream and that special song. It was awesome to have Zach on the keys as well. <laughs> and of course, Hector on the guitar, G hey. up there singing. Uh, we have many, many brothers and sisters with awesome talents in the King of God. And then it was really, really uh, great and special to me. Uh, you know, we were thinking about how are we going to have this service put together? We have to have the people who have been here since the beginning come up here and do the aspects of the service. And it was great to have that contribution message with Job and Aaron right here. And of course, it's so special to have uh, both of their families here with us this morning. Uh, thank you guys for joining us and coming on out. And uh, Hector and Taylor, with that communion right there. And I know that uh, all of us can relate. Uh, how many times have we had to put on a mask because things are not going well? And yet we want people to think that things are going well. And yet in the kingdom we can truly be vulnerable. Amen? And I got a lesson for us this morning. Uh, Preaching is a participation sport. And so I need some yeehaws this morning. Come on, bro, back in that country accent. And I need you guys to be preaching back to me this morning, amen? You know, it is an anniversary service, and what is an anniversary? It's the time of year where you, you get to celebrate the beginning of something. In the same way, what we get to celebrate this morning is eight years ago, the birth of the church here in DFW. And I was quite inspired by the video that was played there uh, right before the announcements. And to see all the baptisms, 293 baptisms in the last eight years. And yet, guys, I'm excited not about what has been done, but about what God is going to continue to do here in the Metro Amen. And I was thinking about this, about the birth of the church. Think, okay, we're here in Texas. Great state here. That's true. But what was the birth of the state of Texas? Wow. Oh. And I don't know if you guys know. But on October 2nd, 1835, there was the Battle of Gonzales, Texas. And it was fought between Texas settlers and the Mexican soldiers, the Mexican government right here. And they fought over a cannon. And basically, the relationship between the Mexican uh, government and the Texas settlers had deteriorated. They were good at first, but then, over time, tensions got stronger. And the Mexican government gave the Texas settlers a cannon for protection against the Native Americans right there. But there came a point when the Mexican government, they wanted that cannon back. So they come to the city of Gonzales. What well, was a town back then, the settlement, with a hundred soldiers, and they say, hey, we want our cannon back. And the Texas settlers responded in a very uh, democratic way. <laughs> Basically, they raised the flag. It was a white flag, and on it, it was a picture of the cannon. There was a cannonball. There was one star. And above it were the words, come take it. And this is what ignited the Texas Revolution and what eventually gained Texas their independence, their freedom. And now we live in this great state that all of us love today. And yet these three words are etched in history. And what they mean for us is standing up for what's right. Yes. Standing up for victory and for freedom and taking what is ours. Yeah. And so with the birth of our anniversary right here eight years ago and honoring the beginning of Texas, the title of the lesson this morning is simply, Come Take It. <laughs> Now, there was a, a war going on, what? and we can relate to that. So the, the Texas settlers, the Mexican government, there's that war, 
And yet, in the same way this morning, there is a war going on as well. I'm not talking about the Ukraine and Russia. I'm not talking about a physical war. I am talking about the very present and very happening spiritual war that wages around us every single day. And it's a war between good and evil. Between angels and demons. It is a war against the forces of Satan himself. And it rages around us every single day. Satan is going to hell. And he knows it. And yet Satan's greatest desire, his greatest task now, while he still has a little bit of time, is to take as many people with him to hell as possible. And yet this morning, in the same way that the Texas settlers, they stood up for defiance, they stood up for freedom, and they fought back, we're going to say the same three words to Satan. We're going to say, Satan, if you want it, you've got to come take it. And we're daring Satan to come and take it. And yet in the same way, there are things that we have to come take if we want to be victorious in this spiritual world. I got three points for us this morning. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. What do we have to come and take if we want to be victorious? Luke chapter 12, verse 13. My first point this morning is, come take your relationship with God serious. Luke 12, verse 13. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge and an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. You know, right here, there's a brother, there's some brothers arguing, amen? They got some sibling quarreling going on. And Jesus tells them a parable. He says, listen, there was a rich man, and he had it very well, and he had a lot of success right there. He yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, after he made all this money, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I got great plans. I'm going to build up my farm. I'm going to build up my property right here. Things are going to be good. And then I'm just going to relax, take it easy, and enjoy life right here. This should sound pretty familiar. It does. Why does it sound familiar? Because this is the American dream. This is exactly what our society tells us to do today. To say, if you want to be happy, you've got to get an abundant harvest. You've got to be very successful right there. Build up your life. Go get the degree, get the career, get the house, get the success, the the American dream, and then you will finally be happy and fulfilled, and life is going to be good to go. There's only one problem with that. You don't know when you're going to die. Life is not guaranteed. And yet we get caught up in the rat race to make all this money to build up our life. And we can put God on the back burner right there. And say, you know what? I'm just going to seek God later in life. And what is one way that Satan tricks people and starts to win this battle? Is he gets people to have a lack of urgency in their relationship with God. This is the mindset that we have. You get to high school, and I don't know if we got any high school students in here this morning. And then we got one high school in this morning. But you get to high school, and the thought process is, hey, I can't seek God now. I'm too young. Let me just wait until I get to college to do that. 
And then you get to college and say, I can't seek that out. I need to enjoy the college experience. Because I just can't have life without the college experience right there. I need it. Maybe later when I'm a little older. Then you graduate and you say, I can't seek God because i got to get a career. I need to start making some money right here. Maybe after I get my career. Then you get married and you have kids. You say, I can't seek God right now. There's just too much stuff going on. Oh. Maybe when they leave the house and they become an empty nester, right? It's just too busy right now. Amen? And then you become an empty nester. And you say, I can't see God. I need to make sure I have my retirement ready to go. Maybe later on. Then you retire. You say, I can't see God. Now I need to enjoy the rest of my life. Maybe when I'm on my deathbed, when there's two seconds left on the clock, that's when I'm going to seek after God and really give my life to Him. And we always wait for the next thing. After we do the next thing, that's when we finally seek God. Here's the secret. There's always a next thing that's going to pop up. And if we're not careful... We become this man in the parable who is so focused on building up his life, so focused on what he wanted to do, that he missed out on eternity. And God said, you fool. Why? Because at the end of the day, what he was focused on was somewhat important. It's not good to neglect your life. But compared to salvation and eternity, it is absolutely foolish. To neglect your relationship with God. You know, we don't know how long we have. Today could be the day. We want to play. We want to make these great schemes. We want to do in life. And that's good. But we just don't know when God is going to call us. Or when that day is going to come. I just got to ask you this morning. Are you ready for today to be that day? If today was that day, are you ready to meet God face to face? Have you been living the right lifestyle or have you been focused on building up your life and neglecting your relationship with God? We need to go after God and take our relationship with him seriously. Amen? Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9. Come on, Joey. Come on, Joey. Verse 23. Luke 9, 23. Just like Joe killed uh, that name right there. I don't want to hear any JoJo's. Amen? <laughs> only, only my mom and Karen can call me that. <laughs> Luke 9, 23. It says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Yeah. Whoever is ashamed of me, my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Yeah. Right here, Jesus says, hey, if you want to be my disciple, you want to be a real Christian, there are actually requirements. Yeah. We, live in, we live in a day and age where it's all about how you feel. Yes. If you feel like doing something, then that's what's right. <laughs> Well, the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. So if you obey your feelings, or should we obey the Bible? Because you can be sincerely wrong. And you're going to go to what the scriptures say right here. He says, he says, hey, what good is it to gain the whole world? And yet lose or forfeit your very self. Saying that you can gain everything. You can get all the accolades you've ever wanted. Everything that you've dreamed of. And yet in the end, if you do that. And you don't have a relationship with God. Useless. It is absolutely meaningless. Yeah. And yet I'm excited because I know nobody in this room wants to live a meaningless life. And we're going to keep on You know, I never forget studying the Bible. Back in 2014 and 15. And, uh, you know, I'm from Alabama. And uh, I'm a little conflicted now because, you know, we're all tied, but also course up. You know what I mean? And I got a crib to you. There it is. In Texas, we're good. We're good. But I started sitting in the Bible in California. 
And I never forget, somebody came up to me, said, hey, do you want to study the Bible? And I'm like, sure, man, I, I grew up religious, I read the Bible almost every day, Absolutely. I love Bible study. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> and we studied the Bible, and after some of the studies, I started to get challenged by the scriptures. And so what I did is I, I backed off from the scriptures. And there was pain in, in facing the truth. You know what I mean? It, it, is, it is very easy to not face the truth. Yeah. That's actually like the preferable thing. Yeah. And it's hard to face the truth. And I was facing the truth, and yet I was scared of the truth. And so what I did is I backed off from it. And I ran, and literally for eight months, I ran from God and the scriptures. Wow. And I was doing my own thing, starting to deceive myself that I was okay but knowing that I wasn't living according to this. Yeah. I was sitting in my living room in, in Alabama. Come on, Alabama. One, one fateful night in the summertime. Come on. And it just, it just hit me. It just made sense. I was like, Joe, what are you doing? Yeah. You know the truth. And right now, if you die, you, you can be the best football player of all time. Do everything you've ever wanted to. But are you willing to lose out on salvation for that? Yeah. And it just got it. I got some urgency. I flew back to California. I started studying the Bible again. And in five days' time, I was baptized due to this. And it's awesome that D has come to get baptized. waiting this morning for the right time to get right with God. If you're hesitant, if you're not sure, if you're like, man, just maybe later in life. No, today is the day. I want to tell you, study the Bible and come and take your relationship with God serious. Amen? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. we got to be urgent. With God. Second Corinthians four. In verse one. That was commitment. We love it. Second Corinthians four, verse one. It says, "Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God." On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Yeah. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Yeah. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Right here, Paul said, hey, we're not using deception. We're not using anything. We're not using this for our own gain. We are just setting forth the word of God plainly. Yeah. And here at this church, this is what we do. We're all about what the Bible says in its context. Yeah. And we're just going to set yeah. this no, word to you that. plainly. Amen? Yeah. Whatever it says in its context. But then he says the gospel is veiled, though. And it's veiled to those who are perishing. And he says the God of this age who is Satan has blinded the mind of unbelievers. And when it says unbeliever, when the Bible says that, it's anybody who is not a real Christian. Mm. You can quote unquote believe in God, but if you're not living out the Bible, technically according to the Bible, you are an unbeliever. Ooh. And so it says that there's a blindness, that there's a, a veil there. And what does a veil do? It makes things confusing. It makes yeah. things cloudy. You can't see clearly right here. And there is a veil. And the second way that Satan is trying to go after people is by using this veil. Yeah. What is one of the biggest veils today? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, I, I am very excited about the feast afterwards. Yeah. And uh, very excited for the Frito Pie. Amen. Visiting with us, we're so grateful that you came to join us this morning. Please stay and get a bowl of that burrito pie. Amen. It's going to be delightful. Second Timothy four, 
And in verse 3, Come on. Yep. what is the veil? It says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. You know, right here it says that people will not put up with sound doctrine. If somebody's not putting up with sound doctrine, that means that they're putting up with false doctrine. And what is another thing that Satan uses? It is the veil of false doctrine that makes things so cloudy in today's world of Christianity. And so my second point this morning is, come take off the veil of false doctrine. You know, it says that they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what they want to hear. Yeah. This is the world that we live in today. Yeah. People don't want the truth. Nope. What do we want? We want things that are comfortable and convenient. Oh. Yeah. That's the truth, guys. Yeah. That's the truth. We, we like, like, lazy boy sofas. <laughs> and, uh, we, we, love, we love Netflix. Yeah. We love it. Why? Because you don't have to wait for nothing. You just play whatever you want. You get it right there. It's the instant gratification. We like things easy, fast, and cheap. And yet what has happened is that that has sifted its way down into Christianity to where Christianity has become the same thing. You know, church today has become fast food. You can drive around and you see Wendy's, you see Burger King, you see McDonald's, you see all these different food places, and you get to choose whatever food you want, whatever you're hungry for that morning. Church has become the same way. You're like, man, what am I in the mood for today? You know, I, I'm really, I just think I need some motivation. I need a motivational thing. I'm going to go to the mega church down the street and get pumped on up right there. Like, man, what, what, what am I, 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 I need an energy boost this morning. Let me go get emotionally high. I'm going to go to the Pentecostal church. Oh, 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 you say, man, maybe this morning I'm just, I want a great concert. Oh, I want to get some music. Let me go to the church. We'll and as the great band, the light show, the smoke I'm going to go worship God in that way. That's what I'm feeling this morning. Or maybe it's this. this. This morning, I'm in the mood for something that's hip and modern. I'm going to go to the guy with the ripped jeans and the brown shirt. And he's just popping in. He's a great speaker. And that's just what I'm in the mood for. And yet, where do you find it in the Bible? And today, people go to whatever church they want that is going to suit what they want to hear. And we've got in a way from relationship, and we've gotten super religious. Whoa. And guys, we've got to go back to the scriptures. Oh. Today, there's over 40,000 denominations of Christianity, and yet there's one Bible. Right. Yeah. And it's gotten so veiled, it's gotten so cloudy. Wow. And the sad thing is that genuine people really get confused. Yeah. People that really love God and want a relationship with God. And they get confused because this is what they've grown up believing that my grandma did this, that her grandma did this, and that we just start going after these traditions instead of getting to what the Bible actually teaches. And this morning, you have got to decide to take off the veil of false doctrine. How can you tell if it's false doctrine? It's confusing. The, the Bible is not confusing. If you can't explain to me why you believe what you believe because you're confused about it, that's not a good thing. And we've got to be those that, that we go to the scriptures. I'm not saying this out of like, I'm better than anybody. No, this was who I was. Come on. I grew up super religious. I know we're in Texas. Alabama is just as religious. <laughs> Man, we, we, love, we love religiosity. You go to church every Sunday. If you don't, something's wrong with you. And everybody's going to talk about it in the neighborhood. <laughs> and you better go to church. And I grew up going to church every single Sunday. This was my life. And yet there came a point when I, when I left the house and I started studying the Bible for myself. And first study, man, pretty good. I agree with this. You got to see God. That's awesome. Yeah. All my heart, well, I don't know if I've been doing that, but. Oh, come on. Man, I mean, you got to see God. Second study. But then as we progressed, I started realizing that what I'd grown up believing 
was not accurate according to the scriptures. Yeah. And it was one of the most painful things I've ever had to endure. Yeah. Because I had to see the truth and I had to decide what am I going to do? Yes, sir. Am I going to walk away from this? Although I know it's what the Bible says. And am I going to go on the rest of my life deceiving myself, thinking I'm okay yeah. by walking away? Yeah. Or am I going to take what the Bible says? Am I going to take the truth, yeah. as painful as it is, yeah. and live my life according to the Word of God? Yeah. You know, there's a quote that I really like that you guys have heard. The truth will make you miserable yeah. before it sets you free. Yeah. And that is exactly what I was facing. I never forget, I was, I was faced with the truth. I'm like, man, this is not what I'm going to believe in. And I was literally crying. I was weeping because of what the implications were about what this meant. And yet, the truth does make you miserable. And yet, man, what a freedom it is when you have it, when you accept it, when you live by it. And man, it feels good to be free. Amen? <laughs> But you know what's easy? It's to keep the veil on. Mm -hmm. That's easy. Awesome. Ignorance is bliss. It is yeah. Knowledge is responsibility. Yeah. And it would be easy to keep the veil of false doctrine on, but right here this morning, we have to be those that choose to go off of the truth instead. We've got to take off the veil of false doctrine so that we can see clearly and live for God. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. I can challenge you. Oh, come on. Be humble to the Word of God. I want to urge you and beg you, be humble to the Word of God. If there's something that the Bible says that does not agree with what you've been taught, you've got to take what the Bible says over your traditions and to be able to. Amen? Amen. Let's keep moving here. Come on, bro. Let's go to John chapter 8. You guys still with me this morning? Yes, If you're visiting, I hope you feel the love of the kingdom. I was a little, when my first time out, I was a little shocked. I was like, why are these people so excited? And why are they trying to hug me? I was like, I was like a COVID visitor. I was like six feet. Like, like six feet right here. Don't, don't come any closer than that, you know what I mean? I'll shake your hand and give you a nice religious nod. But then that, like, and yet... What an incredible thing it was to see the real genuineness in the kingdom of God. Come on. Yeah. John chapter 3. John 8, sorry. It's okay, bro. Let's take it with you. John 8, verse 31. So this is my last point. It says to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Yeah. The answer is, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You know, right here, Jesus says that if you hold to the teaching, you are set free. You know, it's interesting, the guys got offended at Jesus' words. And I'm really grateful because I know nobody in here is going to get offended at the teaching of Jesus. Amen? Come on. Come on. He says, hey, how, how can you say that we're slaves? We, we're descendants of Abraham. He said, no, no, you don't get it. You're not a physical slave, but in every way you are a spiritual slave. How are you a spiritual slave? Because you are enslaved to sin. You're enslaved to sin right here. The last way that Satan takes the victory and comes and takes it is slavery to sin. And at the solution right here that Jesus points out, he says, hey, if you hold to the teaching, then you'll be set free. Our third and final point this afternoon is come take hold of freedom. Come take hold of freedom. You know, as I said, I grew up religious and everything about me looked good on the outside. Just as Taylor alluded to in the communion this morning, everything looked good. I was playing college football, okay. I was getting good grades, I, I, I had friends, and yet on the inside I was totally dead because I was enslaved to sin. Yeah. I was enslaved to impurity. I was enslaved to morality. I was enslaved to drugs and alcohol. I would smoke almost every day and drink it part of the weekend, and I was just enslaved to this sin. And I was looking at, man, where, where do I go to find fulfillment? And oftentimes, often nights, I would go to sleep 
thinking to myself, there's got to be something more to life than this. There's got to be something more. You know, i got to ask you this morning. Are you enslaved or are you free? How did you walk in this morning? Are you like totally free? Are you flying right now? Are you good to go with God? And man, it feels good. Or are there things in your life that you're ashamed of that you feel enslaved to? Mm-hmm. You never forget reading the scripture in the studies. And there was a lot of hope with this because I was like, wait a second. Jesus says, hey, if you hold to the teaching, then you'll be set free. So what is it? How do I get free from sin? If I hold to the teaching, there is no sin that I cannot overcome. Yeah. If I obey the Bible, if I live by, yeah, I know I've been disgusted by the things I've been doing in my past, but man, I want to be set free. Let me hold to the teaching, live by this, and I will be free indeed. Amen. If you are shackled by sin, there's a solution. If you are chained by sin, if you are enslaved by sin, there is a solution for you too, and it's holding to the teaching of Jesus. And we have to be those that decide to do this. That we come take hold of freedom. You know, this morning and afternoon, it's been incredible to reminisce and look back on what God has done these past eight years in the DFW church. And it's incredible to reminisce and to celebrate not just what he's done, but what he's going to continue to do in a powerful way. And as we close out, let us really understand that this is a very real spiritual war. And Satan has lost. He wants to take us with him. He wants to come and take us. And if for us, let us take the victory by coming and taking some things instead. Let us come take our relationship with God seriously. Yeah. I want to charge you, get right with God this week. Study the Bible with the person who brought you out. And you can take it serious right there. Yeah, we must come take off the veil of false doctrine. Yeah. Obey the Bible even if it goes against what you've grown up believing. And we must come take hold of true freedom. You don't have to be enslaved by sin any longer. And as we do this... With these three words etched in history, we're going to continue to say to Satan, come take it. And God help you.